two hotheads on cannabis with Mike Can and Heather Mack on unregularradio.com. Um, we are about to get into the big moment on the show. We're going to have our big break, our 420 break. But after that, we're going to be back with the man himself, the governor, Gary Johnson. Uh, we're going to play two clips from him. One from Nikki, uh, Free Mass Media, Mass Can Normal. We set up something with Mass Can Normal where Gary Johnson did a little video for Mass Can Normal talking about their the organization and the good work that they do. And then we're going to go more recent with Gary Johnson just from yesterday. He was in Colorado, and he uh, led this press conference for Colorado Legalization Initiative. And we're going to play some of that. Um, GaryJohnson2012.com is his website. I'm going to give him a little lead in right now. Uh, Gary Johnson is a former two-term Republican governor of New Mexico. He served from 1995 to 2003. He's an athlete, a skier, a biker, adventurer. The guy has climbed Mount Everest. Uh, He's also done Ironman triathlons. We're going to hear the clips. We're going to give him a call, and we'll be back after 420 with the governor in your questions. 617-606-4122. IF at unregularradio.com. Uh, Rich Fu posted a question on, on our Facebook page. If there's anyone else that has questions for the governor. We have someone calling in right now, it looks like, too. So yeah. we'll, we'll take your calls when we why have time. For why don't sure. we take Keep the call calling. before 420? we got a couple minutes, right? We've got one minute. Let's take the call. You have to wait a second. Like well, this. keep oh. calling. Don't hang up, sir. <laughs> Are they there? Oh, we're working on I'll it. Be there Hello? Now. Hello, caller. Uh, yeah. What's your name, sir? Right now. What's your name? Esteban. Oh, Esteban. Oh, we, oh hey, know, Esteban. I, I'm so glad you called. We have to, before we say hello, I want to thank you very much for helping on our show. You've been hooking us up with major guests. Wonderful speakers. Yeah. We're, I, I think we have some new things, some really exciting things in the works, yeah. too. He's got us see money from Slightly Stupid. He helped us with Judge James, Gr- James Gray. Thank you, Esteban, thank you so for calling. What, what's going on? What are you doing today? Florida. Uh, I'm listening, but I guess I'm a little behind you. I was calling because I heard your comment about Whitney Houston, and then I posted an article about Ibogaine, which ah. is something that are you guys familiar? I'm with familiar Ibogaine? with Ibogaine. Yeah, yes, but, but a lot of our listeners and it may let's, not be. So why don't you tell us? Peter McWilliams tell is us also what an it is. advocate. What about Ibogaine? Well, I, put, I put it on your page. I put a letter about how legalization of all drugs will cut addiction in half because it will legalize Ibogaine in the United States. It was an article written by. And what is Field. Ibogaine? Tell us what it does and what it's used for. I mean, I don't want to get in trouble with the uh, the federal government because they do limit our free speech on these things. But uh, yeah, why are the people interested a, in Ibogaine? Uh, it comes from the Tabernet Iboga plant, and it's from the west coast of Africa. It's used in twelve countries now. Um, what it does is it stops addiction to heroin, cocaine, crystal meth, alcohol, cigarettes, and it only takes a single dose. Um, it, and it has no addictive properties. Is there any negative side effects? Um, well, it's a psychedelic, but no. Um, there <laughs> have been a few deaths, but that's because the people that have died, it's because they've, from all the years of substance abuse, they have weak hearts and they couldn't withstand it, and they were most likely going to die anyways. But one of the leading researchers was Dr. Deborah Mash from the University of Miami, and that's who I discovered it from. She took out, I think it was 382 or 386 cases um, in an international waters with government approval, and every single person came back, cured from their addiction, and nobody, you don't want to do Ibogaine because, I mean, it's, unless you're, unless like, you have a problem, psychedelics, yeah. I mean, there is recreational use, but I don't think it's, yeah, you only got to use it for addiction. Well, um, Esteban, we, we do have to, uh, Cut it a little bit short because we have to uh, go to our 420 break and, and bring back Gary Johnson. Well, I know should definitely yeah. look into Ibogaine. Ibogaine. And, uh, and, you're and, right. Maybe Whitney should have as well. And I would love you to call back later if you can because we, we love your calls and we love hearing from you. And tell us how we're doing. everything you do. Any feedback you have anytime, please call us. I will. Thank All you. Right, I'm still listening to your show. Awesome. Yeah, that's that's what we like to hear. That's there for Esteban. Beautiful. Thanks, Esteban. Go to 420. Yeah. All right. We interrupt our program to bring you a special broadcast. Bing bong, it's 420. Our 
are individuals that have sold small amounts of drugs on numerous occasions and are there because of mandatory sentencing. Youth that are, are behind bars are almost 100% drug related. Not all of them, but um, I, as governor of New Mexico, went to a lockup facility for juveniles in New Mexico. These were actually, this was an out of state facility. These were from juveniles from all across the country. And 100% of them were there because of drugs. I, I think arguably there are 30 million Americans right now that but for our drug laws would otherwise be taxpaying, law-abiding citizens. And I'm talking about 30 million Americans who to this point may have been subjected to the criminal justice system because of our drug laws. The main reason for border violence is the prohibition of drugs. Legalized marijuana and in my opinion 75 percent of the border violence with Mexico goes away because it's estimated that that's the activities that the drug cartels are that 75 percent of the drug cartels activity is engaged in the marijuana trade. Uh, if we can't connect the dots between 28,000 deaths south of the border over the last four years and prohibition, uh, I don't know if we ever will be able to. Uh, these are disputes that are being played out with guns rather than the courts. And I think it's important to point out that it's never going to be legal to smoke pot, become impaired, get behind the wheel of a car. Establishing that impairment, I think that's going to be very revealing that it's going to take a whole lot of the consumption of uh, marijuana to become impaired as opposed to uh, alcohol. I really want to say that I support MassCan, which is, uh, which is uh, Massachusetts normal and uh, repealing our prohibition laws regarding marijuana. Getting to legalize marijuana. Let's legalize marijuana. Let's control it. Let's regulate it, let's tax it, let's make this world a better place. If it feels like we've been here before, there's a good reason for that. Call it Colorado Marijuana Legalization Part 2. Deja vu all over again. Is everybody set? It's not exactly a do-over. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. More like a second chance. End marijuana prohibition in Colorado. 14,000 signatures they needed. Bringing in far more than enough. Closer to 2,000 should be enough to do what they wanted to do last month. We're ready to lead the country. When the same group held a very similar news conference to announce well what they as thought as at the time was the end of the signature drive. Of course, last time they didn't have him. Coloradans have a chance to end marijuana prohibition for the entire country. One time New Mexico governor, one time Republican, current libertarian presidential candidate, Gary Johnson. There has to be a first, and Colorado has that opportunity. He supported marijuana legalization since 99. And the more people talk about this, the more people understand it, uh, the better chance that it has to end. You're listening to Two Hotheads on Cannabis with Mike Can and Heather Mack, only on unregularradio.com. Live on Two Hot Heads on Cannabis. You're listening on regularradio.com. We will be taking phone calls. We have a special guest on the phone right now from Colorado. Uh, our telephone number is 617 606 4122. At a certain point, we will open up the lines if you have a question for our special guest. Definitely give us a shout out 617 606 4122. On the phone right now, we have the Republican governor, two term governor of New Mexico for two terms from 1995 to 2003, one of the first mainstream politicians to ever come out to support medical marijuana publicly while in office. Uh, he's an athlete, a skier, a biker, an adventurer. He has climbed many mountains, including Mount Everest. He's uh, competed in the Ironman Triathlon. Uh, he was in Denver yesterday at a press conference. You just heard him speaking for the Colorado Legalization Initiative. His name is Governor Gary Johnson, and he is running for president. Hello, Gary. Mike, great to be on with you. Great to be on. Thank you so thank much. Thank you for your advocacy. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for your advocacy. We're, uh, we're very proud to have you on the show today. What, uh, you're in Colorado right now still? Yes, 
Uh, and, um, you know, just a correction. Going back to 1999, I have always advocated legalizing marijuana. I think that medical marijuana is um, really, a, it's, a, it's a no-brainer, meaning it should be allowed. And uh, I always have said that we should legalize marijuana as opposed to decriminalize because uh, legal uh, decriminalize turns its back on half the problem, which is, you know, uh, individuals having to sell it. So uh, law enforcement just shifts in a decriminalized environment. Law enforcement just shifts itself to catching those that sell it. And when it's decriminalized, you know what? When, you, when, when it's not illegal for you to have it, you're more apt to go out and make it uh, make it more well known who are the sellers. So uh, we need to we need to legalize marijuana. We need to uh, get this out from under the black market. Is, is that why you were there yesterday in Colorado? I just I, I think that Colorado has the opportunity here to be the domino uh, that falls that causes all the dominoes fifty fifty state dominoes to fall. Uh, when it comes to rational drug policy, somebody's got to be first, and I really think Colorado does have the opportunity. It's my understanding that uh, when it came to the uh, prohibition of alcohol, that the uh, that the first domino to fall was New York by telling the federal government, we are not going to enforce alcohol prohibition laws any longer. It's my understanding that that was really what started uh, a cascade that resulted, of course, in repealing uh, in changing the Constitution. Now, what makes... At least, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, well, at least uh, alcohol was a constitutional uh, amendment that did get repealed. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no basis uh, yes. legally, in my opinion, for the government to tell us what we can or can't put in our own bodies. Amen. Now, I was going to ask, what makes you think that, uh, you know, what makes you feel that Colorado is, you know, potentially the, the place to do it? Obviously, a lot of us had our had our hopes up for Prop 19. Uh, my partner, Alex, who is working on Prop 19, is in the studio with us today. He wants to ask you a few questions as well because he met you and you were such a, you know, a, a big supporter of that campaign. Now, where do you think that uh, Colorado has advantages um, that maybe California did not to make this happen. Well, I think that uh, I think that Colorado really blazed the trail here in Denver. I am in Denver uh, five years ago when they, when citizens of Denver voted to decriminalize marijuana on a campaign based on marijuana being safer than alcohol. Also, as a border uh, as a border state to uh, Colorado to the south, New Mexico. Um, I've always, uh, I, uh, I've always um, perked up, if you will, or noticed that when it came to marijuana surveys, uh, perhaps uh, that, that Coloradans um, use marijuana more than on a per capita basis um, than any other state. So um, California, uh, I thought that that had a, a terrific opportunity. I didn't know if its time has come. But I, I will just say that Colorado is cl much closer than uh, California was. And even if it doesn't pass in Colorado, this is happening. Exactly. And you, you, you both probably have been pointing this out. Three months ago, Gallup comes out with a poll. 50% of Americans yeah. mm -hmm. support legalizing marijuana. That number has never been that high. Yeah. Absolutely. And the reason is, is that people are talking about it. And when people talk about this issue, the issue advances. So yeah. I just think that uh, having this initiative here in Colorado will get a lot more people talking about it. The more people talk about it, the more understanding results from those conversations and the more support sure. there is toward rational drug policy, which starts uh, with looking at drugs as a health as a health issue, not as a criminal justice issue. And you're trying to translate that into support for your presidential campaign as well, right? I mean, that's. I think it. I think yes, and I think that this is a, a an issue that uh, that crosses over the lines when it comes to dozens of other issues. Absolutely. Uh, the ACLU about three weeks ago came out with a report card on all the presidential candidates. Now, the ACLU is a group that is dedicated to civil liberties. They're a group that's dedicated to the Constitution, the first ten amendments of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. Anyway, 
They came out with a report card. 24 Liberty Torches was the perfect score. Uh, Newt Gingrich had four Liberty Torches. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right. Mitch Romney and Rick Santorum had zero uh, Liberty Torches. There you go. President Obama had 16 Liberty Torches. Ron Paul had 18 Liberty Torches. And Gary Johnson had 21. Yeah. So your point to, does this, is this, is this part of your campaign? Yeah. Well, it's, it is very much a civil liberty issue. It crosses over, I think, when it comes to dozens of other issues that you and I should be making decisions in our own lives, not the government, as long as the decisions that we make don't put others in harm's way or potentially put others in harm's way. Speaking of that, so we, we have actually posted, we have a Facebook group we've been promoting this interview today a lot of people had questions people have actually been voting on questions to ask you today and the most voted on question was it was actually one and two the the, the number one question was do you know who mark emery is and would you free him from prison and the second was would you pardon nonviolent drug offenders in a johnson administration as president anyone that's serving a federal prison term for nonviolent drug offenses Yes, to all those to all those questions. Mark Emery should be released. One of the pledges that I'm making here running for president is there needs to be a pardon process for those that have served out uh, their their sentences for nonviolent, uh, arguably victimless uh, drug crime. And one of the unstated things that happened during the prohibition of alcohol after it was repealed was going through and categorically issuing these pardons and commutations. Commutations being um, actually taking people out of prison and freeing them. And yes, I would establish a process for that uh, immediately. Um, That is something that needs to be done. There are tens of millions of Americans who have been subject to our criminal justice system that, um, I know you're playing a clip earlier, but I say it all the time that otherwise uh, would be tax-paying, law-abiding citizens. I'm one of the 100 million Americans who have smoked marijuana, and um, but for luck, I guess, uh, I wasn't <laughs> subject to the criminal justice system. The majority of uh, Americans that have smoked marijuana have never been subject to the criminal justice system. This is an issue, prohibition, uh, where... I believe 90% of the drug problem is prohibition-related, not use-related, and that's not to discount the problems with use and abuse, but that should be the focus. Absolutely. And I, I mean, that's interesting because you weren't always um, an, you know, outspoken about your own use of marijuana. What, what made you make the decision to uh, admitting that publicly? Actually, I was very upfront about that before uh, before uh, I was elected governor the first time. This was something that I was asked, and I have always um, uh, I've abhorred politicians that uh, that uh, are hypocritical, that don't talk about their own use and yet pass laws that uh, that if those laws were enforced when it came to themselves, they might find themselves behind bars. I think that's horrible. I think it was horrible when President Clinton said that uh, he uh, <laughs> he didn't he inhale, but he didn't <laughs> inhale. Um, and and when I when I talked about my own marijuana use, um, it was because it was something that I did. And when I was asked, uh, "Well, was it a was it an indiscretion? Are you sorry for it?" Well, no, I'm not. It's uh, it wasn't an indiscretion. It was something a lot of people did. I was one of them. And it's a, it's something that a lot of people currently do. Uh, I'm not one of them, but you know what? Um, that's a decision that you should make, no one else. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, as as uh, your presidential run has gone with the Libertarians right now, you're running for their nomination. I, I don't understand their process. I don't know if it's the same as the Democrat and Republicans. If you win this nomination... Do you get to choose the vice presidential candidate that runs with you, or does the convention and the delegates choose that without your input? Well, so 
So the um, libertarian uh, process is 50 state conventions electing delegates to go to the national uh, convention, which is in Las Vegas, the first week in May, at which time the delegates to the national convention will elect a nominee. It will also elect a nominee for vice president. Uh, the uh, Libertarian Party determines the vice presidential nominee, but um, historically they've taken the recommendation of the uh, uh, of the presidential nominee. Okay. So uh, I hope this is a good problem that I have to have. I yeah. really hope to be the nominee, and if I here. am, uh, I would choose somebody, or I'm going to try and choose somebody that. Do you have any I'm hints? <laughs> Do you have any hints for us on who it might be? Who who you could consider? Well, you know, na- names that float around that uh, that are prominent, that are well known. Ron um, Paul. That might be- bring <laughs> gravitas to a to a uh, vice presidential debate. Uh, you know, I, I I'm saying this humorously, but <laughs> Jennifer Aniston is a uh, wow is, is a libertarian. Yeah, uh, how about her? Uh, she would be amazing. <laughs> Yeah, well, have you have you talked to her at all? Have you? Maybe we should you? get her on the show. Uh, I haven't, and, <laughs> and I have I have no idea why she would want to do this at all. But but my yeah. tongue in cheek point is is yeah. there's somebody with a lot of prominence, sure, and well known, and um, you know somebody like that could really advance the cause of liberty and freedom. Drew Carey is also another uh, libertarian. Um, there are a lot of libertarians that um, out there that I think fit that same bill, and um, just a lot of business people. John Mackey, prominent libertarian, uh, he wrote an editorial, you know, on the healthcare in the Wall Street Journal, and got a lot of lot of heat over it. So I don't think he would have any intention of wanting to do this. But sure. somebody that is very well known, very successful, capable of articulating what it is to be a libertarian, um, that's what we're looking for. That's excellent. That's, thank you for that answer. Very what excited. It, I would yeah. like to ask, though, what about for those of us, that is an excellent answer, but what about, what about those of us who are not libertarians, who do <laughs> not define themselves as libertarians? What would you say um, that wouldn't be to, me. to convince us? Right, exactly. <laughs> I'm saying personally, because I'm right there with you on the personal liberties and the, you know, the government shouldn't tell us how to you know, make personal decisions about what does and doesn't go into our body. Um, but what about, what about um, you know, other issues such as, I mean, you've proposed cutting you know, Medicare and Medicaid, which you know is is got a is a huge problem. We you know I believe in in a balanced network of resources for people who maybe don't have. I don't, I don't know. Have same, you have uh, you actually? Cu- I don't know if you have. Have you, uh, that, Kennedy Johnson? Have you proposed? That, that was a, that was a proposal, correct? Well, yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, so so what, what is it to be a libertarian? Let, let me just speak with a broad brush here. Okay. I think libertarians take the best from both Republicans and Democrats. I think that the majority of people in this country, and Heather, this is what I kind of heard you say, I think the majority of people in this country uh, would describe themselves if they knew what the definition of classical liberal was, that they would describe themselves as being classically liberal. And classically liberal is, you got to live within your means. If you don't live within your means, there's a consequence to that. I happen to think that the consequence to that is, is that we will experience uh, an absolute collapse of our government and our money. And that is very real, and it's, a, and it's a horrible kind of situation. That's the bad news. The good news, we can fix it, but we need to balance the federal budget. The, when, when you hear about, when people hear about a 43% reduction in Medicare and fall off the chair, don't fall off the chair. Look, we need to cut Medicare by 43%. We need to balance our resources uh, with what it is that we're, our expenses, with what we're taking in, or we're going to find ourselves without any Medicare. Yeah. That's the alternative. Yeah, absolutely. is a complete breakdown in government, government services, and our money. Yeah. Well, the fact that our money will be worth nothing. Let's see. Now, if- <laughs> couple that with the, with the broad brush stroke of being a social liberal. The notion that government should not involve itself in decisions that only you and I should be making. And I fundamentally believe in that. I think the majority of Americans fundamentally believe in that. And that really is a libertarian. 
Yeah. Right yeah. On. I have a what question if, for a libertarian point of I view. I just have a quick I have a quick follow right. up though cuz I mean, you know, what if we just how about we end the drug war, right? And then we end the war in Afghanistan and then we have we save enough money there that we don't have to cut Medicare. But then we can all get along. <laughs> I think that sounds well, good to me. And, and, and Heather, let, trust me on this one, is that the math doesn't... I, I agree with cutting yeah. those issues, but they don't even begin to add up to what it is that That's we true. need to cut. We need to cut $1.4 trillion in federal spending now, yep. or we find ourselves in a situation where we're printing money. We're printing money to cover these debts. The result of this is going to be inflation. It's going to be a lot more money to buy the same goods and services. It's going to result in higher costs to the point of, pot of, of a potential monetary collapse where money doesn't buy anything. Yeah. And if you want to look at other countries in the world where this has happened, uh, it's happened many times. Yeah. It happened in Germany uh, after World War I. It happened in Russia in the late 80s. Uh, that's probably the, the biggest example uh, in most recent times. Zimbabwe. Greece. In Greece. Um, these things happen, and it's inescapable given the mathematics. Yep. You point out obvious cuts. Uh, <laughs> I agree with those obvious cuts, but there are other cuts. <laughs> Medicaid, Medicare, military spending, the big three. Yep. And that's where all the money goes. I mean, that's where the debt is. Where we're borrowing from Medicare every single budget. We're trillion over a trillion in, in the hole every single year. Um, coming from a libertarian perspective, I have a I have a question on right to work. Do you support it? Uh, do you, number one, do you support it? Because I I I feel like right to work is not right to work. I feel like it's a right for a corporation to break a contract. And I want to know if you support that issue. And what is your feeling on it? Like, yeah, do you no, hear no, what I'm coming? I, I support I support right to work, and right to work very simply is is that you, as a worker, um, if uh, so, using as an example, let's let's say Boeing, because that uh, you know has been in the news. It's been in the news, South Carolina. They opened up a plant. Well, if if Boeing is unionized, if the majority of uh, of workers in Boeing are unionized, what Right to Work says is that if you go to work for Boeing, you have a choice. You can either join the union or you don't have to join the union. That's Right to Work. I'm, I, I support Right to Work. I think, back to, back to you and I making decisions I think that only you and I should make, I think the decision uh, to, as to whether or not I want to belong to a union is, is my decision, not something that should be mandatory. Yeah, I, I, but uh, if you took the union job, you know, like that's my issue. It's like, I, I, I think it's breaking the union. You know, like number one, they're moving jobs from union states like Massachusetts to states without unions, and they're doing it because they know that they can break the unions that way. That's that's my, from what I've heard from people, I, I uh, that's yeah, my but, one but, issue. That's but, but Mike. Mike, let, let, let me try another. Let me try okay. another angle. <laughs> let's, let's say you graduate from college, you want to be a teacher. Uh, and you have to join the teachers' union. And so you have to pay dues to the union. Now, what I'm hearing you argue is, is that uh, the unions have uh, made that job desirable in the first place, sure. and that there's an ob a certain obligation that perhaps you should have as a, as a new employee to, to pay into that, but you don't have a choice. And fundamentally, I think you should have to have that choice. I, I understand where you're coming from. I, I think it's a good uh, yeah. a good discussion to have. Um, I what, do too. We get a yeah, bunch of people too. calling yeah. in the studio. We, we, yeah, right we now. have a lot of phone calls. We, we want another, uh, we, Gary. Do you have much? Can we we because we have stu more people in the studio have questions and we have phone calls. Yeah, good. I've got about ten more minutes. Okay. If you want to fill that? That's six fine. one seven six zero six four one two two. If you have a question for Governor Gary Johnson, definitely give us a call right now. Do we have someone on the line? We have a phone call. Yeah. Hello, who's on the line? Hey, this is Julia from Peter's Peak. Oh, wow. <laughs> hey, let me introduce this. This is uh, Governor Johnson. This is Julia. Julia works, oh my works with uh, Peter McWilliams .org. Uh Peter McWilliams was a famous writer. Uh, he was a libertarian. He really supported our cause, medical marijuana. He died for this cause. He was a best-selling author. Do you know about Peter McWilliams, Governor Johnson? I do not. I do not. I'm going to have to check that out. Oh my so, uh, Julia, Julia, do you have a, do you want to say hello first of all to Governor Johnson? 
Yes, Governor Johnson, hello. <laughs> um, well, I Julie, so thank you for your my... activism. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I would be so honored to link you to PeterMcWilliams.org, um, if you would like. And I wanted to give you a quote from Peter, if that's okay. Yes. He once, yes. He once said, <laughs> he once said, I'm tired of people thinking that libertarians don't have morality, that they don't have values. That's a lot of hogwash. Libertarians are the only politicians with values. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a Peter McWilliams fan. Already. No, he's already. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> well, thank you, Julie. Are you listening to the show right now? Um, yes, definitely. I've, I've, I love his ideas and everything. I, I think he would make a great president. So, <laughs> Is that an endorsement from you? <laughs> well, everyone's telling me I'm supposed to support Ron Paul, but <laughs> I kind of like Governor Johnson. Hey, that that that's going to get you a lot of votes, Governor Johnson. She's very popular. <laughs> and, and, and talking about Ron Paul for a second, you know, um, Ron Paul and I are, for the most part, talking about the same uh, message. For the most part, we have some disagreements, but for the most part, we're talking about the same message. And let me just say, Communications 101. When you hear the same message from two different sources, or from ten different sources, the more sources you hear the same message from, the better you yeah. understand it. Yes. The, 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 the more clarity there is to it. So I'm trying to, uh, I don't think Ron Paul is going to win the Republican nomination, and so that's the end to that uh, to that torchbearer when it comes to uh, will, will freedom you, and liberty. Speak and, it, will uh, you ask him you know to... What? Um, Will you? I, I have the opportunity to continue to carry that and uh, perhaps uh, have it resonate with a lot more people. Will you, will you ask him marijuana. to endorse you? Look, the more people talk about marijuana legalization, the better the issue does. The more people talk about classical liberalism, the more people talk about libertarianism, you know, the, the more support it garners. Yeah, definitely. I, lo I, I support you all. I support you both. I support other candidates, too. I mean, anyone that's speaking the right yeah. issues, that's the key to me, and I agree. Um, you, do, will you, 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 will you, you look for him? Will you, you got it. Will you ask him to endorse you if he doesn't win that G GOP nomination? No, I think, you know, that, that has never been my tact, to ask sure. for endorsements. Uh, he asked for mine in 2008, which I readily gave, and then when I dropped out of the Republican primary... I asked uh, everyone that supported me if they would support Ron Paul. I hope that happens, but uh, for me to go out and seek that from somebody else, I, maybe that's the libertarian in me. Sure. Uh, I, I, I can, don't know if yeah. I should have to ask that that's a, a decision that individual involved should be making. I like that. We, got a few more we, like that. we, we got have more two calls, too. Callers uh, can right we, yeah, let's take another call, Mike Newman. Thank you, Julia, for calling. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Julia. Hello. Hello. Hi, you're on the air. Hi, how are you doing? Good. Uh, c can you turn Good. your radio down? And uh, what's your oh, name? Yeah, it's down. Uh, what's your name? Uh, Joe McKemis. Joe, hey, you're on the phone right now. We're live on Unregular Radio. Do you have a comment, feedback, or question for Governor Johnson? Yeah, I sure do. Um, Governor Johnson, um, as you know, uh, Tuesday, President Obama signed into law the FFA Reauthorization Act. Uh, I don't know if everyone knows, but it includes a provision directing the Federal Aviation Administration to develop rules for the testing and licensing of drones to be thrown, uh, flown in U.S. airspace and to expedite the process for authoriz authorizing their use by federal, state, and local agencies. And uh, they project that as many as 30,000 drones could be in use over the U.S. by 2020. And in the statement that you said, um, you mentioned that it threats the, to pr the privacy in America from our own government. Um, seems to never end. Uh, does Congress really think they can just stick an um, all-by-the-way provision in an obscure piece of legislation directing the FFA to clear the way for 30,000 drones to fly over our neighborhoods and have no one notice? So my question is, do you think that uh, legitimate law enforcement, let alone the DEA, 
who is already grossly misusing funding with a uh, spending rate of $500 a second without the government giving them more expensive high-tech equipment to add to their already out-of-control spending on a war that is senseless and wasteful of taxpayers' money. And, and what do you believe the true nature of these drones are for, uh, in your opinion? Will they be used for searching inner-city neighborhoods for crime, or do you believe they'll be primarily used in rural areas looking for uh, cannabis grows on the American citizens' private property? All right, all right, Joe. That We got the question. Governor well, Johnson? Joe, Joe hits, it on, hits it on the head, and what, I, what I'm hearing from Joe, and it's the same yeah. coming from me. Yeah. There's some sarcasm here. I mean, really, what are all these drones for? And don't you know that there are going to be some very legitimate purposes for drones that will turn out to be beneficial and government will do everything it can to headline those kinds of uh, situations like somebody lost in the wilderness and uh, the drone finds the person in the wilderness but I have a I have a sense that these drones are going to be used to spy on all of us and um, I just I think this is a this is the wrong direction I think we fought wars over uh, Big Brother and uh, Big Brother coming out to look for us. Now, if they want to just have the uh, the drone squadron to go look for those uh, that are lost in the wilderness, great. Um, and I suppose there are other uh, applications for that, too. But uh, flying over my backyard and taking pictures, to what end? Um, infrared uh, sensors and drones flying over neighborhoods to to uh, determine if anybody's growing marijuana with, uh, you know, with uh, fluorescent lighting. Ah, stop. Stop. Yeah. 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 End of that. No <laughs> deal. Well, thanks for that question, Joe. That, that was a... That was a good question. That was a good question. And we have another question in here. Uh, Alex is here, uh, who worked on Prop 19. He was one of the campaign organizers over there, and he had the chance to meet you a few times, and he had a question that he wanted to ask you, so... Great. Yeah, Gary Johnson with... So many initiatives coming up this year um, for the 2012 ballot to legalize marijuana. We're starting to see take place the debate over what marijuana legalization should look like. And we're seeing a range of initiatives from, you know, outright almost legal. It's lettuce legalization to tighter initiatives like the one coming up in Washington that doesn't allow grow your own and has very strict THC um, blood content limits for driving. Um, arguably strict enough such that regular smokers would be always considered to be driving under the influence. Um, I'm wondering, from I know you must have thought about this in, in your own time, but what is your ideal vision of cannabis regulation? Like, what what would your a brief synopsis of what your ideal bill would look like, and what you would support? I, I know you would support most anything, but what is your ideal? Yeah, yeah. No, uh, Alex, I think it's going to end up being 50 states that uh, implement uh, legalizing marijuana similar to alcohol. So if I were in charge of uh, legalizing marijuana in New Mexico, for example, I would make it similar to alcohol, that it be bought and sold uh, uh, out, of a, uh, out of a store that uh, is going to ask you for your ID, uh, that we would uh, tax it, but that we would allow for homegrown. And I've always maintained that homegrown isn't going to last very long. Because you, why would you buy homegrown? Why would you make bathtub gin if you could go buy tangere? And the point is, is that why would you grow your own if you can go down and buy something that's very reasonably priced, quality, quantity known, um, that's my vision when it comes to uh, marijuana. Um, I'd also like to know, would there be a vision of marijuana legalization that you would not support? Or do you believe in legalization at all costs? I do. I, I believe in all, uh, in all costs. And I, I believe in states' rights. I believe in 50 laboratories of innovation and best practice. So I think there are going to be some states that really screw this up, just like states will screw up just just like a, a model that, where that exists, 50, 50 states working on this in different ways, there's going to be some fabulous success that gets emulated. There's also going to be some failure that gets avoided, but much better than Washington uh, top-down. And yes, uh, any initiatives at all, and, and I'm very aware of uh, drug testing THC levels 
in your body that uh, virtually make it impossible for you to ever drive. You're not impaired, uh, but you can't drive because of THC levels. That's not right. And that's the problem with drug testing right now in the Absolutely. workplace. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, we should be able to drug test in the workplace, but we ought to be able to determine impairment. Yep. And right now, the problem with uh, marijuana testing in the workplace is it does not test for impairment. Yeah. It just tests for THC levels, which I'm afraid exist for a long period of time, uh, you know, long beyond there to where there, there has been any impairment. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we, we really respect your time and thank you for taking the time out. We would love to have you back again on the show to give us an update on your campaign. We hope uh, you enjoyed it today. Um, I have a couple, uh, one last little question, and then we want to find out more where we can find out more about your campaign, where you're going to be, what you're going to be doing. But uh, the quick question is, I know that you um, are a great athlete. You know, you're involved in all these different endeavors in terms of climbing Mount Everest. You had a major accident. I, I'm, I'm in a similar position. I'm a, an athlete too. I was a wrestler. I have a bad back. I use medical marijuana. You became a medical marijuana user because of a horrific injury. Uh, can you tell us quickly about that and how did you use your medical marijuana? Was it vaporizing? Was it smoking? Was it edibles? Well, I, I found my... And by the way, I had a great time being on and I'm going to hold you to bringing me back on, but... Uh, yes. Yeah, let's hear it for that. <laughs> <laughs> in 2005, I had a horrible paragliding accident. Uh, I had a burst fracture of my 12 T vertebrae. Uh, I broke six ribs. I, separa I separated my ACL, and I had cartilage damage, uh, a meniscus damage in both knees. And I was given a prognosis to lay on the floor for six <laughs> weeks. Oh. And I mean lay on the floor, eat yeah. on the floor, sleep on the floor. The only, the only thing I could get up for was to go to the bathroom. And I was given prescription pain medication, and um, I've used prescription pain medication on just a handful of occasions, and I thought it was horrible. Yeah, I thought it, I thought it uh, created one new pain and did away with another. Yep. And I found myself in this situation, and in this situation, I had a friend come by and say, you know, Gary, um, how about if I go get some marijuana? And I want to say, Mike, it wasn't medical marijuana. I, medical marijuana was not in place in New Mexico at that time, so I was breaking the law. But the answer when they asked me, would you like uh, us to get you some marijuana? The answer was yes. I think that that will help out a lot. And uh, based on my own personal experience, it helped out a lot. Doctors were telling me, that I would never recover from what had happened to me, that I would never be really active again. And I have completely recovered from that accident, and, and I think um, I want to help in that, in that process. Wow. On. Well, we're very that, happy. Yeah, we're very that. happy. I'm glad you're that. still active. You showed them. <laughs> Look at how yeah. active you are. Yeah, you're still riding this bike. <laughs> Just running for president. No yeah. big deal. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank, yeah. thank you both. Well, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Yeah, thank you so All much. Right. Have All a, right. Have Bye. a great Thanks. day, Gary. Gary Johnson, 2012.com is where you can find out more about his campaign. And you can check him out on YouTube. He's always on there. And he's doing his uh, town hall live events now on his website. So you can, if you want to, if you, we had a lot of calls. We didn't get to all the calls. And we're sorry, guys. Yeah, we're sorry. <laughs> but if you have a question, he will be back on the show. You heard it. And yep. you can also check out his website and ask him questions there. Gary Johnson, 2012.com. Wow. And we have uh, Nicole D'Amico and friends are, are setting up, and they're going to be playing for us live in the studio um, in just a few minutes. So uh, let's take a quick break, and we can get them all set up. And, and we'll then we got some, uh, some beautiful music for you guys. <laughs> Two Hotheads on Cannabis. We'll be back. Your attention, please. Radio Unleashed on RegularRadio.com.